at 1514 hours on September 4th. Two Venezuelan F-16s punched through the cloud deck at 5,000 feet, executing what fighter pilots call a hook attack. The lead pilot rolled inverted and yanked his stick back hard. The airspeed indicator, an analog dial from 1983, spun past 550 knots as he drove toward the USS Jason Dunham stern. His wingman broke left, diving toward the water to split the destroyer's defensive focus. Two targets, two angles, one ship. Classic bracket attack. The only problem was these F-16s were cutting edge when the first Top Gun movie was in theaters. But this wasn't 1986. The destroyer Sea Whiz snapped to attention, its white dome tracking the lead F-16 while the ship's second mount swiveled toward the wingman. Six barrels on each mount began their pre-spin, ready to spew 4,500 rounds per minute. Inside the Combat Information Center, fire control technicians watched both systems achieve locks simultaneously. The spy radar wasn't just tracking, it was reading their autobiography. Each radar pulse bounced off the aircraft 30 times per second, giving them all the information they needed to take them out in a matter of seconds. The lead F-16 pulled out of his dive at 500 feet. After Burner screaming, his thumb found the weapon selector, AIM-9L Sidewinder. The infrared seeker head began its circular scan, hunting for heat in the three to five micron wavelength. No tone, no lock, nothing. The missile was searching for jet exhaust at 1,000 degrees Celsius, the specific CO2 emission spectrum it was programmed to find. Ship stacks emit at 8 to 12 microns at 200 degrees. The Sidewinder literally couldn't see the destroyer as a target. Even if it could lock, the AIM-9L's 11-mile range was pathetic. Modern F-16s carry AIM-9X with 22-mile range and off foresight capability able to lock targets the pilot isn't even looking at. These Venezuelan relics had to point their nose directly at targets like it was still 1983. The wingman leveled at 50 feet, salt spray coating his canopy. His radar altimeter, when it worked, was screaming warnings. The system cut out intermittently below 500 feet, a known issue since 2018 that required parts Venezuela couldn't buy, couldn't steal, and couldn't make. He pulled up from 100 feet, immediately getting painted by three different radars. His ANALR-69 radar warning receiver lit up, but only in the forward hemisphere. The rear left quadrant was completely blind, where water infiltration had corroded the antenna connections. The rear right was intermittent. He was flying half blind against radars that could burn through lead shielding. This was the problem with attacking an Aegis destroyer in Block 15 F-16s. No targeting pods meant no laser-guided bombs, not that they had any. No GPS integration meant no JDAMs. Their 1980s mission computer couldn't even spell GPS. No AGM-84 harpoon capability. The weapons interface didn't exist. No harm missiles to suppress the destroyer's radars. Their entire anti-ship arsenal consisted of guns and sidewinders that couldn't see ships. Modern F-16s would carry AGM-158C LRASMs, stealthy missiles with AI that could identify specific ships from 200 miles away. These Venezuelan jets were showing up to sink a destroyer with weapons designed to shoot down MiGs over Germany in 1985. This was the problem with attacking an American destroyer. It wasn't one weapon system. The Venezuelan pilots were executing a textbook anti-ship attack from the past. Argentine Super Itendards had used this exact profile to sink HMS Sheffield in the Falklands. Approach low, pop up, launch Exocet, escape. Except Sheffield had a Type 965 radar that took 20 seconds to complete a rotation. The Dunham Spy updated 30 times per second. Sheffield had gaps in coverage. The Dunham had four fixed arrays watching everything. Sheffield Sea Dart missiles needed manual guidance. The Dunham's SM6s were fire and forget with active seekers. It was like using World War I tactics against the Death Star. The lead pilot attempted to acquire the destroyer with his APG-66 radar for a gun run. The mechanically scanned array swept back and forth like a metronome, taking three full seconds per sweep. Then he switched from search to track mode. He lost the entire air picture. The radar could either search or track, not both. 
Modern F-16s can track while scanning, maintaining situational awareness while engaging. This pilot went blind the moment he tried to lock the destroyer. Worse, at 200 feet altitude, sea clutter overwhelmed the ancient processor. Every wave looked like a mountain. The destroyer appeared and disappeared like a ghost. He had no sea surface search mode, no Doppler processing to filter clutter. He was trying to find a 500-foot ship in an ocean of radar noise, manually adjusting gain knobs while flying 580 knots at 500 feet, totally unaware of what was going on below them. The lead F-16 pulled up at 1,000 meters, aborting his gun run. Fuel gauge, assuming the sensors weren't lying again, showed 4,200 pounds. Three minutes of afterburner had burned 2,400 pounds. His wingman joined up, hand signaling his fuel state. Without Link 16 data link, they were reduced to finger counting at 400 knots. Five fingers twice, 5,500 pounds. American F-16s had received Link 16 in 2002, creating shared consciousness between aircraft. This, in turn, caused their formation flying to look more like a divorced couple at a wedding, together for looks only. They split again for another attack. The lead F-16 dove toward the bow while his wingman approached the stern. Classic tactic, divide defense fire, force target prioritization. Except the Aegis system didn't prioritize. It assigned tracks to each weapon system. The destroyer could engage 18 targets simultaneously. Two F-16s were barely a warm-up before this next system. A flip of one switch, and the Slick 32 began its electronic symphony. The Venezuelan APG-66 radars, operating on a fixed 9.3 GHz since Reagan's first term, had no frequency agility. Modern radars hop frequencies thousands of times per second to avoid jamming. These radars were broadcasting on the same channel they'd used when MTV still had music videos. The jamming was surgical, inserting false targets at will. The lead pilot's display showed three destroyers, then five, then one, then none. His wingman saw the destroyer split into two contacts moving opposite directions at impossible speeds. The lead pilot pressed his attack despite electronic chaos. Diving from 3,000 feet, he pushed past 550 knots. The F-16 shuddered, not from aerodynamics, but from structural fatigue. 40 years of Venezuelan maintenance, which is to say 40 years of hope and J.B. Weld. The airframe had exceeded design life by 15 years. Metal fatigue was approaching critical. Something cracked behind the cockpit. Probably non-critical. Probably. Hydraulic pressure fluctuated as fluid leaked from seals that should have been replaced years ago. The flight control computer, calling those 1980s analog circuits a computer, was generous compensated sluggishly. Modern F-16s had quadruple redundant digital fly-by-wire. These had dual redundant analog systems where redundant was optimistic. The destroyer's crew was placing bets on which system would get the hit if this was real. The SeaWiz operator demonstrated perfect firing solutions. 1.3 seconds, 97 rounds, intersection calculated to the centimeter. The tactical action officer explained how one megawatt of directed electromagnetic energy would overload the F-16's electrical systems. Generators already running at 60% capacity couldn't handle the surge. The Venezuelan pilots were unknowingly providing a masterclass titled How Not to Attack a Modern Warship. The F-16s made one final pass. Line abreast, afterburners roaring. They thundered over at 300 feet accomplishing nothing except becoming the world's most expensive noisemakers. The lead pilot keyed his radio to coordinate with his wingman, an encrypted VHF without frequency hopping. It didn't have any advanced, encrypted communications channels like Havquick or Syngars. They were essentially using radios with less encryption than a baby monitor from Walmart. As the F-16s turned south, fuel gauges approaching bingo, the intelligence team cataloged everything. Every emission, every frequency, every tactical mistake. Tomorrow, Maduro would send them back with orders to be more aggressive. Tomorrow, the Americans wouldn't just watch, they'd play. At 14.30 hours on September 5th, the same exhausted pilots strapped into the same tired F-16s. They'd spent the night being screamed at by commanders who'd been screamed at by Maduro. 
The orders were explicit. Force a reaction. Get something for state television. The pilots ran pre-flight checks on aircraft that shouldn't have been flying. The lead jet's inertial navigation system showed them 20 miles from where they were, drift from a system that hadn't been calibrated since 2006. No GPS integration because the mission computer from 1983 had less processing power than a microwave. The wingman's radar warning receiver was completely dead in two quadrants. His official horizon froze for two to three seconds randomly. They were flying museum pieces into a rematch they'd already lost. This time, they tried the high-low split. Classic anti-ship doctrine from when warships had blind spots. As the lead F-16 climbed through 10,000 feet, his engine compressor stalled. Bang! Like a shotgun from the cockpit. He pushed the nose down, reducing angle of attack. The engine recovered with a shudder that shouldn't happen. The F-100 PW-200 needed overhaul every 4,000 hours. This engine had probably 6,800 hours. Compressor blades were cracked from fatigue. Any sustained maneuvering would cause another stall. He was flying a fighter that couldn't fight. The destroyer had been expecting them since engine start. The E-2D Hawkeye's radar detected the takeoff from 200 miles away. The spy radar acquired them at 180 miles. By takeoff, every American asset was watching. A Virginia-class submarine recorded their communications through a photonic mask. An MQ-4C Triton drone streamed 4K infrared video to the Pentagon where admirals ate popcorn. The Venezuelan pilots were handing out free intelligence like Costco samples on a Saturday. The lead pilot rolled inverted at 12,000 feet and pulled into a 60-degree dive, steeper than trained, steeper than smart. Without a targeting pod, he was aiming using a fixed reticle on his HUD, technology from when phones had cords. Modern F-16s with sniper or lightning rods could identify and track targets from 40 miles away, designate multiple targets, provide laser guidance for smart weapons. This pilot was essentially guessing where bombs would land using math from the Vietnam War. Not that he had bombs, or racks to carry them, or computers to calculate release points. The wingman skimmed waves at 50 feet, trusting his radar altimeter that cut below 500 feet. Salt spray coated his canopy. The seal had degraded, letting moisture infiltrate everything. His APG-66 radar showed nothing but clutter. No sea surface search mode meant the radar couldn't differentiate between waves and ships. Modern F-16s with APG-83 AESA radars have synthetic aperture modes that can map terrain through weather, track ground vehicles, even identify specific ships. This pilot was flying blind, instruments failing, praying his 1980s inertial navigation was approximately correct. Neither pilot knew the destroyer was playing with them electronically. The Slick 32 injected phantom contacts into their radars, ships appearing, multiplying, disappearing. Without frequency agile radars, without electronic countermeasures, they had no defense. The lead pilot's display showed the destroyer 30 degrees left of reality. He was attacking empty ocean. The wingman saw three destroyers, then two, then five. The destroyer had turned their sensors into kaleidoscopes. Modern F-16s with ANALQ-131 ECM pods could detect and counter jamming. These Venezuelan jets were defenseless against electronic warfare that didn't exist when they were built. At 3,000 feet, visual reality didn't match radar. The destroyer was 500 meters right of where the APG-66 claimed. The pilot yanked the stick right, pulling 5 Gs in a rolling correction. His G-suit, leaking since 2019, couldn't maintain pressure above 5 Gs. The overstressed airframe groaned. Something in the left wing route made a sound like tearing paper. Hydraulic pressure dropped 20%. If his ejection seat rockets hadn't expired in 2018, if the parachute had been repacked since 2009, if the seat wasn't held by bolts scavenged from a crashed F-5, he might have punched out. Instead, he pulled out at 800 feet, ready to give it one more go. The wingman climbed to 5,000 feet for a slashing attack at 1447. As he rolled in, the destroyer's Sea Whiz finally elevated its barrels, not to engage, but to make a statement. Six barrels spun to firing speed, creating that distinctive buzzsaw whine. 
The fire control radar locked him with tracking data so precise it could predict which rivet would fail first. But the Sea Whiz didn't even have to fire to take this F-16 down. Venezuelan maintainers already did its job. The port generator was producing 60% power through a voltage regulator cannibalized from another F-16. Circuit boards throughout the aircraft were held together with solder and prayer. Wiring insulation had degraded to the point where systems randomly shorted. He was flying a collection of failures waiting to cascade. He dove through 3,000 feet. His world exploded into alarms. The spy radar had switched from search to track, focusing six megawatts of electromagnetic energy on his aircraft. His radar warning receiver, the parts that work, screamed. But it couldn't identify the emitters. No software updates since 2006, and it didn't recognize modern radars. It was warning him about threats it couldn't name, from directions it couldn't determine, at power levels that shouldn't exist. The electronic warfare suite was pumping so much energy into his systems that his artificial horizon tumbled. His radar compass spun like a slot machine. His fuel gauge flickered between empty and full, their sensors overwhelmed by electromagnetic interference. The pilot pulled out at 500 feet, G-meter pegging at 7.5. His leak G-suit provided maybe 60% protection. His vision tunneled to a straw. For two seconds, he flew unconscious, 500 feet above water at 400 knots. The F-16's degraded flight control computer barely maintaining stability. He came to at 1,500 feet, disoriented and tasting copper. The lead pilot made one final run at 1449, pushing his dying F-16 into maximum afterburner. As he accelerated through 500 knots, the damaged compressor stalled again. This time, it didn't recover. The engine was done. 6,800 hours of running, finally collecting its bill. The F-16 yawed sharply right as asymmetric thrust took over. He pulled the throttle back, trading speed for control. Now approaching a destroyer at 300 knots in a wounded bird with five minutes of flight time remaining, maybe less. The destroyer's tactical action officer watched the thermal display showing the F-16's engine running 200 degrees above limits. The aircraft was literally cooking itself. The Sea Whiz tracked away, professional habits dying hard. At 2,000 meters, the fire control solution was perfect. 1.3 seconds, 97 rounds, tungsten meeting aluminum at a precise point in space. The operator's finger hovered over the engage button, one twitch, and the Venezuelan F-16 would become an aluminum cloud. Both F-16s formed up for the journey home. They burned 14,000 pounds of fuel, their entire monthly allocation, to accomplish nothing except provide comic relief. The destroyer maintained course toward Colombia, its crew already forgetting the encounter. As they crossed into Venezuelan airspace, the lead pilot's engine finally quit. He managed a dead stick landing at Barcelona Airport. The wingman landed with 300 pounds of fuel, 90 seconds of flight remaining. The Pentagon's response was to deploy 10 F-35 Lightning IIs to Puerto Rico. Not because of Venezuela. They'd been scheduled for months, but the timing was perfect. Against Venezuelan F-16s, it wasn't even a contest. It was like bringing a Formula One car to race against a shopping cart missing two wheels. Bye for now.